Well, it's my privilege uh, and joy to be sharing with the Equip Training College, and I'm going to be speaking on the subject of throne rights, which is a really inspiring and great subject, uh, which I'm glad to be speaking on. Uh, we've got four teaching sessions, and um, so, so it's a joy to be, be, be with you and be sharing. My name's Trevor, Pastor Trevor Murphy from Narandra, uh, country New South Wales, and uh, so, um, yeah, it's really good to be sharing. Um, in this unit, in this subject, we look at uh, some of the amazing things that God says about us and our identity uh, solely because of God's power at work in our life. Um, Paul spoke in Ephesians 1, in his letter in Ephesians 1, a really well-known prayer. You know, he says he prays for them constantly and says a few things that he prays for. And one of those is obviously the inheritance that we have. Uh, he prays for them that they would know and understand and have a revelation of their inheritance and their calling and the power of God. Finishes by saying the power of God that is at work in us is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. And what he's, uh, what he's really wanting for them is to be able to understand fully uh, what God is, has done in their life and the power of God that is at work um, in their life. Um, and so I want to talk in this first session about the, the, the challenge that sometimes comes when we, we hear of what God's power does and who he says we are, but there's some, uh, there's some awareness, isn't there, of our human humanness and the human limitations that we have in our life. And so I guess, first of all, before we can really embrace the power of God in our life, we have to be aware of our own human limitations. Because if we are, then it helps us to be more dependent upon Him and to know that His power in our life and what He says about us is because of what He does in our life, not because of what we do. And not us trying harder or to be something that we can't be without His power in our life. And so that's why Paul was praying that. He's saying, I pray that you have a revelation of all that, he, that God has done in your life, and particularly of the power of God that is in your life. So um, in our notes, uh, when we talk about power principles, we need not only to know what they are, but also how to apply them effectively and decisively in our life. Because we hear things and we read things and we know they're right and we know what God can do. But there's this kickback that takes place sometimes in our own human thinking uh, to, to question what God has said and to maybe doubt or to, uh, to wonder how it could be, be true what God has said about us in our life. But you know, Paul also said something that I think helps us in this. He says, when I am weak, then I am strong. What he understood is that when, we, when we're honest about our own limitations, then we're always going to be quick to to recognise and uh, uh, understand our dependence and reliance upon the power of God in us. And so um, when we realise and admit to our own weakness in ourselves, we can stand on the strength and the power and the work of God um, in and through us in our life. You know, Jesus himself said, of my own self I can do nothing, but what, I, what the Father does, that's what I do, etc. And then, um, so... I remember in my, in my office having that up on the wall, just uh, saying, of my own self I can do nothing. But I finished that off, this little poster on the wall in my office, I finished it off by saying, but I'm not on my own, I'm not of myself. And from Philippians 4, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me or infuses uh, his inner strength into me. And so we're just going to have a bit of a talk in this first session about uh, just our humanness and we're going to look at how the disciples themselves uh, you know, we're very uh, ordinary and imperfect people that God then used in a significant way. And then we'll look at some of the facts about what God says about us and who we are. And it's not because of us, but it's because of Him. You know, there's one thing that can short circuit the power of God in our, in our personal life. And that is having this sense of inferiority. Because... Um, because of our humanity. So we need to look at our humanity and know that what we have is only because of God's power. But sometimes when we look at our humanity, we tend to, to draw back within ourselves or uh, have this feeling that God can't bless us or use us in the way that he wants to and the way that he says that he can and will do. 
Um, before we look at some positive facts derived from God's works, uh, let us look at the 12 disciples and how they acted and reacted, how human they really were. Just um, as I read that from the notes, uh, my mind goes back to a book by E.W. Kenyon called Two Kinds of Righteousness, a book I read many years ago. And it just talks about how we have been made right through Christ and that it's not of our own doing. And one of the things he, he says is he gives a definition of righteousness and he says righteousness is the ability to stand in the presence of the Father God without a sense of guilt or inferiority. And sometimes when we think about the greatness of God we can, uh, and we think about our own human limitations, we can feel small and want to pull back. But what we have to do is we have to be honest about our limitations, but trust what God says about us and know that he uses us even in our uh, imperfection and in our humanity. And so let's look at the disciples for a moment. The first thing is that they were ordinary um, you know, they did extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary things. God uses us sometimes. We get amazed at the way he uses us to do things that are um, anything but ordinary. But really, he's using ordinary vessels. And so uh, we read about the disciples uh, that they were, um, they were just average Jews, nothing spectacular. In 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 27, um, we read this, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. And we know Paul's not trying to offend us here and say that, well, he only uses, you know, uh, sort of ordinary people, people who are foolish, uh, people who are weak. But, but what he's trying to do is paint this picture that it's not about our, uh, our strengths. It's not about our uh, positive qualities or, or great qualities. But really, even in our comparative foolishness and our comparative weakness, God uses us because he brings his wisdom. He brings his strength. He brings his might. And so we don't have to hold back because of an awareness of our own limitations. Just as the disciples, you know, we're ordinary people and we read about them and we read about some of the, the things that they, they did that were very ordinary. Um, and we understand that they were just ordinary people that were called, that were chosen. So the wonder of this passage is not primarily wanting to insult us or talk about us, but the fact that God has chosen you. He's chosen me and you. And Jesus takes this one step further in John 15, 16. Uh, John 15, 16 says this. He says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. And so he's the one who's chosen us. And, and there's great encouragement in that when we think about that he knew us before we were born, that he knows and understands our human weakness, but he also knows and understands the, the gifts and talents and personality that he put within us. But he doesn't rely upon that, but he takes that when it's consecrated and offered to him. He takes that and he uses that. And he uses ordinary people like you and me to be able to do extraordinary things because of what he does in us. So you, you did not choose me, Jesus says, or, uh, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. And I just love that it says, and, and that your fruit should remain. Lord, may we see your fruit in our lives and fruit that remains. And so they were ordinary. The disciples were ordinary. But the disciples also were not perfect. I don't know about you, but that gives me, uh, makes me uh, feel very relieved, you know, that um, it's not about perfection because we know our flaws and we know our humanness. But when we look at the disciples and we look at other people that God used um, in, in the Bible uh, in so many amazing and powerful ways, we see that they were not perfect. In many, for many reasons, sometimes it was because of the mistakes they made. Sometimes it was because when God began to call them, they questioned back and said, how can this be when, you know, and they'd begin to describe themselves and their weaknesses and their failings from the past. And so um, 
you know, uh, it encourages us that God used many people and gave us examples of many people in Scripture that, that were not perfect people. And there's a list there in your notes. Abraham, Lot, Saul, Eli, David. You know, David's an easy one to think about the failings and the weaknesses. And yet also it's easy for us to see the amazing way that God used him to minister into his generation, but also uh, through uh, many of the Psalms and, uh, and, and that are such an encouragement and a blessing to us. Solomon, Gideon, uh, Peter. You know, I've just written down here, Paul. Paul spoke of himself as the least worthy. Uh, we understand that Paul was uh, someone who, uh, in his zeal, uh, made a terrible mistake in persecuting the church and opposing, you know, what would have been the, the things that, um, that we would have seen as godly things in that time and period. And so uh, they were not perfect, and that encourages us that, being people that are also not perfect, uh, God says things about us that we can embrace and hold to as being true. Um, they often did not understand Jesus. We refer to this a little bit later on, but I'd like to just mention Peter. Uh, Peter, um, in Matthew uh, 16, uh, Peter, this is probably one of Peter's biggest uh, failings that we all remember so well, but I'm, I'm always slow to criticize our disciples in their imperfection because they inspire me so much in the way that they then offered their lives for all that Jesus had for them or to follow Jesus fully. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. This is Matthew 16, verses 21 uh, down to, to verses 25, to verse 25. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. And again, you know, before we begin to criticize Peter, we think, wow, what if we were there? What if we were there hearing that information? And we're loving, you know, being with Jesus and we're so much uh, listening to what he's teaching and seeing the miracles that he does. And then when he begins to talk about how he's going to be killed by the religious people and whatever, we, we begin to think, no, that can't be. And so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Again, in his zeal, he wants to protect him and let him know that I'm, I won't let this happen. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And uh, again, I, I, I know, uh, put yourself in Peter's shoes, just how hard that would have been to hear. But he wanted to just, Jesus wanted to just stop him right there and say, There's another perspective on this. You've got this really wrong. And so he said, It's not. You're not understanding uh, from my perspective, but you've got the wrong perspective on the way that you're seeing things. And so he was corrected for that. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him desire, deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, some of Jesus' teachings uh, took a little while for the disciples to understand. So they often didn't understand Jesus. And they often displayed a lack of faith. Again, that, that encourages me the way that, that sometimes they just didn't weigh up the situation or they were doubting and asking honest questions and bringing an honest response to what was happening around them. In Matthew 8, 23 to 27, it says, Now when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Again, for a moment I put myself in that situation and think uh, it may have been a little disheartening to be challenged that way. And he arose and he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Because they were, they were watching on and they were seeing what was happening. You know, in the storm, they thought, What's going on? And then, um, you know, they began to be afraid. And then, uh, then as uh, Jesus spoke to the winds and the, the waves, uh, they were, you know, just astonished. 
even though they'd got to know Jesus and seen many miracles, they were astonished at what he did. And so, uh, you know, they often didn't see from eyes of faith and they demonstrated in a very visible way at times their, their lack of faith, that fear crept in and they didn't understand what was happening. Just looking at these people makes us realize that we do not differ very much from them. Yet Jesus used them in powerful ways to turn their world upside down or downside up. We must, from the start of these lectures, learn how to accept our humanness and focus our attention upon God and to realize it's not about us, but it's really about Him. It's not about uh, us depending on our strengths and our abilities, but recognizing our weakness, but then knowing that He is with us and that His power is inside of us. So now let's move on and look at um, I, I guess a, a more inspiring, although that is quite inspiring, looking at the disciples and just thinking about how God used them, even though in many ways they're similar to us in, in their humanness. But let's look at a few facts about what God says about us. And there's so many things we could look at, but uh, here's just a, a few that I think will inspire and encourage us. Number one uh, fact, I am a spiritual being. In Genesis 1, right from the beginning of the Bible, it talks about uh, creation, of course. We know that. And it just talks about the steps of all the things that were made. And then when it comes to verse 26 and, uh, and where uh, God made you and I or made our ancestors, he made the first, uh, the first man, Adam. And, and God said this. He said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You know, we were made in his likeness. And it's not obviously talking about physical appearance. That would be impossible and and crazy to think about. But in nature, in our makeup, he made us uh, to be spiritual beings. God is spirit. And he made us in that sense. He made us to have the capacity to have a spirit and for our spirit to be made alive, uh, obviously through Jesus Christ and his spirit coming to live inside of us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, another passage that I, that I really love, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 9 to 12, we'll just read those. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by him. What a privilege it is to know that we are spiritual beings and that the Spirit of God lives in us. You know, this year, uh, my wife Sandra and I will have been married 40 years in September. And so, you know, we've done a lot of life together and we've got to know each other pretty well. And there are still occasionally things that we learn about each other. Sometimes, you know, there are things that I think, well, after all these years, you know, and she still doesn't get that. And I'm sure she says the same about me. After all these years, he still doesn't get that about me. And so we're learning about each other. And so even if we live together and spend time together and, um, and you know, obviously just get to know each other as well as can be expected in that context uh, as a husband and wife over 40 years. And before that, we knew each other uh, as acquaintances. But, you know, it's still impossible to fully know and understand everything about her. And that's what it's saying here. It says, who can know the spirit of a man or who can know a man fully but the spirit of a man or a woman? And so here it says, but you can know God. 
because you don't just know him as someone who is there walking with you and beside you, but you can know him uh, as, uh, as one who lives inside of us. He's put his spirit inside of us. And so the spirit of God lives inside of us and reveals to us in a way that we couldn't understand any other way. Uh, just what he is like and what he has in store for us and, and how we, uh, we can get to know him in such a special way. We're spiritual beings, which, you know, when we think about that he lives inside of us and his spirit lives inside of us and we can know him that intimately, it's just a wonderful thing. It seems too good to be true, but it's a fact, it's a reality. And we need to uh, embrace that and stand on that and affirm that as being something that God has declared and said is true. You know, in John chapters 14, 15, 16, 17, just a beautiful passage of the Bible that I so often uh, talk about and preach about at home in my home church at Narendra and other places. Um, Jesus is beginning to tell them that he is going to depart from them and leave them. And so he encourages them through those chapters. There's a few spots where he just stops and says, you know, I will not leave you comfortless, but I will send uh, my, uh, my helper I will send the helper, I will send the comforter, depending which translation that you read. And that's the, the Greek word paraclete. It's the one who, who comes alongside. And, and in many ways, he's saying that when I send the helper, he will show you things to come. When I send the helper, he will uh, reveal truth to us. But you know, one place it says that when I send the helper, I won't leave you comfortless, but I'll send the helper. And it says that when I send the helper, that he will testify of me. He'll be with you and in you. In one place it says it's an advantage that I go. You know, don't be, don't be grieved. It's an advantage that I go because if I go, I will send the, my spirit, the helper. And so what he's really saying is I can be here with you and I can walk alongside you and I can teach you and we can uh, do life together and you get to know me very well. Sometimes we look back and we feel a bit envious of the disciples and say, well, wouldn't it have been great to just live with Jesus and walk with Jesus? We could have got to know him so well. But you know what Jesus was saying to them? He says, he was saying to them, it's going to be an advantage when I go because when I go, the spirit will come. I'll send my helper, my comforter, the paraclete, the spirit. And he will be with you and he'll be in you. And he says, he will testify of me. He will reveal things about me. He will help you to understand me. This is what Jesus is saying. He will help you to understand me and obviously therefore understand my father in ways that you could never understand just doing life with me. Because when he's inside of you, like this Corinthians passage said, when he's inside of us, you know, we have the spirit of God. And he lives inside of us. And so we can know and we can understand things about God that would not be able to be understood otherwise. So what a beautiful fact that I am a spiritual being. What a great truth and something that we need to hold on to. You know, when we think about this subject of throne rights, we're looking that it's not because of us. You know, we have this human dilemma that we are human, that we are imperfect, just like the disciples, just like many characters in the Bible that God used. We can take encouragement from the fact that in their imperfection, God's power was able to work in them and through them. And in the same way, we are spiritual beings and His Spirit is in us. We need to accept that as truth and believe what God in His Word says about us and, and hold on to it as, as true and live in the reality of that. To realise, that is to live in the reality of it. And as I, said at the, as I said at the beginning, it's no wonder Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus and he said, I pray for you. I pray that you'll have a revelation, that you, you'll have an understanding, that your understanding will be opened to know what is your inheritance, to know the calling of God on your life and also to know the power of God that is working in you. Not something that could be naturally understood, but something that's understood because we are spiritual beings and His Spirit lives inside of us. So I am, you are a spiritual being. And then I am loved by God unconditionally. You know, there's so much in that. We can just say pretty flippantly, God loves you, God loves you, God loves me. We can say that and it, it's, it's meaningful and it's true. But we need to understand that God loves us unconditionally and all that flows out of the fact that he loves us unconditionally. 
Human love is given when certain conditions are met. Some take these concepts into the Christian life. So when they fail God at some point, when they uh, become aware you know, of their imperfection, they feel that God has stopped loving them at that particular time. Our sense of security with God comes from understanding that God not only loves us unconditionally, but that he himself is love. Romans 8, 31 uh, down to 39. And I will read it to you. You may be familiar with this passage, but I'll read it to you. And um, like in this passage, it really brings out in a almost... Uh, insulting way in some ways because there's so much uh, so much detail it's like every question that we could ask everything that we could think about that would be a reason why God wouldn't love us it's attempting to address in this that these things will not separate us from God's love let me read it to you and just think about it as we read it through uh, even though we may be familiar with it don't let familiarity rob from the reality of what I'm about to read what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Verse 37, Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this passage is attempting to say everything that we could think that might disqualify us from God's love. Everything that we can think that might be an indicator that God has stopped loving us. People say, don't they, you know, why, how does God love us if this happens and that happens and whatever. But here it's saying everything that we could possibly think about cannot separate us from God's love. And God's unconditional love is so amazing. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 11, again talks about this same thing. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. Those three words, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You know, it's telling us, firstly, that God is love. When we think about that, it's not that just God does loving things. And if we think about that, well, God does loving things. We could sometimes be uh, forgiven for thinking that maybe one day he'll change his mind. Maybe one day something will happen because, you know, we think from a human perspective that something might happen that disqualifies us from love or, you know, that, that, that'll stop God from loving us. But this statement, God is love, those three words, they're so powerful because it says that that is who God is, not just what God does. And it's impossible for God to deviate 
from who he is. When, when we look at things that happen sometimes and we say, you know, is God stopped loving us? Is, is, you know, where is our God of love? What we can always come back to is that we know this. We know that God is love and therefore that nothing that he does ever is contrary to who he is. We could say God is truth as well. And so everything that, that's associated with God, we know is true. And so when we think about not what God does so much, but what, who God is, then we see that what he does flows out of who he is. And so he can never act contrary to himself. It's a different subject, but it helps us to realize also that because we have his spirit inside of us and the fruit of his spirit is love. You know, in this passage, it's also saying that if we love God and we have relationship with God and God lives inside of us, then in many ways, if we truly do that, then love is going to flow out of us. And if that's truly happening inside of us, then really it will be impossible for us to also deviate from a life of love. And it says, if you say you, um, you, know, you have God and you know God, then it says there's something missing if you don't love. It says if you, if you say you love God but don't love your brother, then you know, you're a liar. It's pretty strong words, but it's really saying something's missing. Because who we are and you know, what is inside of us determines you know, what we do. And sometimes if we act contrary to who we are, there's a question mark there. Well, God never acts contrary to who he is. God is love and he loves you and I um, unconditionally. And nothing can separate us from his love. You and I were a spiritual being. And you and I are loved by God unconditionally. What a beautiful uh, reality to, to live by and how that impacts our life. And the third one here, which is another one that impacts our life in a significant way, is that I am a child of God. And we've heard that said many times, just like we've heard God is love. You know, you're a son of God. And we can sometimes think, well, isn't that good? But not really think about what that fully means for us. It's a, it's a powerful thing that God has done in calling us his children, adopting us as his children, choosing us as his children. You know, I sometimes say, you know, we're born into a natural family and uh, they didn't really choose us in some ways. They chose to have us maybe. Sometimes we may have turned up unexpected. But, you know, um, uh, when someone is adopted into a family, what a compliment that is because there is something special that not only did they just turn up, but they were chosen to become part of a family. And so an adopted son really is, um, there's something special about that. And we're adopted children God has chosen to adopt us as his children. Uh, John 1 verse 12 says, As many as received him, to them he gave the authority or the right to be called a son of God. And so we are made a son of God, you know, uh, legally and rightfully. But 1 John 3 1, in your notes there, 1 John 3 1, again, always been a favorite verse of mine. It says this, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. And it goes on in the start of verse 2, just says, Beloved, now we are the children of God. Some translations say, this is what we are, a child of God. But that first verse says, behold, which really means stop and think about and take a hold of what that really means. Yes, God loves us. Yes, he's made us his son, his child. But then when we think about the, the manner of love that's expressed in calling us his child, in some ways God is saying that he is uh, embracing us into his family. He's taking the responsibilities of a perfect father. You know, we know imperfect fathers, but he says he's taking the responsibility of a perfect father to... Uh, to watch over us, to provide for us, to guide and to lead us, to protect us, to um, enable us and to equip us. Equip us. All those things are the, the actions of a perfect father. And so he is choosing to embrace us into his family and to love him as a son. And so behold what manner of love the father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Think about 
Just what that means. Think about the, the expression that is from the Father's heart to call us His children. What is He saying that He wants to be to us? What is He promising? What is He making a commitment to, to be to us um, as His children? This is not a mere legality though. It is, uh, sorry, I'll just, just read. This may seem like a simplistic statement until we realize that through the new birth, we are actually God's offspring. You know, when we were born again, we were born again of his seed. And we won't go into that too much in this particular uh, session. But he put his nature, he put his seed, he put himself inside of us. And so uh, we are a new person. We're a new creation. We know that. The Bible tells us that. And so... Inside of us is his very nature, is his very person, his seed. And so we now live out of it. We don't try to just change ourselves to be what a Christian should be. But as we receive Christ and he makes us his child, he puts his own nature and heart and person inside of us. And so what we're learning to do is to live out of that new nature that is inside of us. What a powerful thing that is. Not just a mere legality that we can call ourselves a son, but that actually we become partakers of his divine nature. God is my father and we are partakers of his divine nature. Second Peter uh, verse, uh, chapter 1 and verse 4 says, By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And so by his great and precious promises, we know where we find those. We know where they are expressed to us in his word. That by taking a hold of his great and precious promises, exceedingly great and precious promises, we actually realize and become partakers. We actually experience this new nature that is put within us. It's not a Logie Award performance to act like a son, but it's actually living out of this new nature, this new uh, divine nature that he has put within us through his great and precious promises. You know, the couple of verses before that, verse 2 and 3, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God, and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain or lead to life and godliness, godlikeness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So by his great and precious promises, taking a hold of those and standing in those, we become partakers of his divine nature. Having escaped the uh, the corruption that is in the world through lust means really escaping the selfish compulsion within us to live the godly compulsion within us. And then it says, as we get to know him, then he's given us everything that leads to life and godliness. Beautiful couple of verses there in Second Peter. I do not feel that I am a child of my parents. It's not about feelings. You know, feelings are great. We love the things that we can feel and we love feelings and what they bring to our life. But feelings are a great servant, but not a great master. And so sometimes we, we challenge how we feel with the truth of what is stated about us. I do not feel that I'm a child of my parents. Nevertheless, it is the truth that there is not a thing that I can do about it. I am in various ways a mixture of my father and my mother. I have taken on their particular characteristics. The son of a bird can fly. The son of a puma can run. Um, for these are the characteristics of their parents. You know, I have a bunch of grandkids and one of the things I really enjoy just uh, as I observe them, you know, growing up, uh, the oldest one is 10, I think, at the moment, and most of them are down under five. And so as I watch them develop and grow, what I enjoy doing is seeing the, the traits of their parents and, you know, even the traits of their grandparents coming through. When they do something good, you know, I like to say, well, that's, you know, where'd that come from? That's come from me as a grandf grandfather. But um, it's not always true. But um, there are traits that are coming through because there is something of the nature of the parents that comes through. And so in uh, 
in a, in a spiritual way, in a supernatural sense. Uh, we are like God in nature because God is our parent. Romans 8.14 says, As many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. You know, John 1.12 talked about receiving Him and becoming a son, uh, in a sense, legally. But here it's talking about if we let the Spirit lead us, then we become like mature sons. That word sons in this verse means is the Greek word huius, and it means mature son or one who shows forth the character of their father. God's power is spiritual. It goes beyond the natural and neither can it be understood naturally. 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us that these things are not understood naturally, but they're spiritually discerned. Let us not get caught up with our weaknesses. Let's be aware of them and trust God that what He has done is not based upon our ability to, to make it true uh, by our own actions or our own strength or uh, whatever. But, but in our humanness, we have become spiritual beings because of what God has done in us, because of His power in us. And so we begin to see ourselves differently in the light of the truth of what God says, not on our human weakness that we're so aware of. Rejoice that, our, that we are children of God and that our names are written in heaven, as Luke 10, 20 reminds us to do. Well, God bless you. Thanks for that. And we'll go on to the, uh, the next session shortly.